uh, when we are at home, we can be uh, learning something. And uh, like today, we are, we are going to focus on musculoskeletal imaging, which is a very important part of our um, radiology. And in our practice, we all practice as a general radiologist. Some have sub-specialization, but we all have to go through some, uh, do everything. So we have two uh, speakers. They're uh, masters in their own field. I'll introduce them. And we have got two panelists as well. So we we'll learn from them what the clinician wants to know. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Shakil, who's the um, Dean of uh, Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka University, and Honorable Dean of Medical Faculty of Dhaka University. And he's the General Secretary of uh, Society of Radiology and Imaging to give the welcome speech. Thank you, Sanya, for introducing me. Um, good evening, everybody, for the 16th webinar. This is organized by BSRI and Red Aid. America, basically, Red Aid is strongly supporting BSRI for the developing our radiology field, in the, especially in the musculoskeletal intervention. And I welcome you all for this uh, nice uh, webinar. I hope the two speakers, especially musculoskeletal MRI, focus of the sports medicine is a very challenging job for the radiologist. And also from the, uh, those who are working with the physical medicine, those who are working with the sports medicine. And I think the lecture will uh, develop our young radiologist for this field. And another speaker, Dr. Moyes, I met him in PGI Chandigarh in 2006 and i hope uh, this lecture especially in the um, ultrasound in the ankle joint is a new challenging job uh, for the radiologist everybody is thinking about the, the musculoskeletal side it is very difficult to, uh, to dedicate it in the ultrasound everybody is very really conscious about this but i think the lecture will uh, brief the new dimension of the radiology thank you all from the uh, radiology and the society of bangladesh so thank you, Dr. Sharier. I'm going to now introduce our first speaker. So this is a very impressive resume. Dr. Laura Foyd is a professor of radiology and orthopedic surgery and oncology. And uh, she was born in Lebanon, but she had a BS at MIT and Stanford University. After this, she decided she wants to be a doctor. So she became a, uh, uh, she became a doctor and a radiologist and uh, she studied at the McGill University and then did a radi radiology residency in Columbia, fellowship in MRI in Thomas Jefferson. Now she joined John Hopkins in radiology in 2002 and uh, she is a part of making advanced protocols for assessment of musculoskeletal tumors by MRI. And she is the chief. Um, so, uh, chief of musculoskeletal imaging since two thousand and um, fourteen. Okay, so um, I today her subject that she's going to talk about is musculoskeletal MRI. She'll focus on sports medicine, and especially the knee joint. So. Um, Dr. Laura Pyatt. Thank you, everyone. And hello to all of you from Baltimore. It's morning for me. And um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And I really want to thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm always uh, excited to talk to people from that part of the world. Um, and as she mentioned, I'm from the Middle East myself. So I came to the United States late. I'm going to share my screen. So let me know, do you see my screen at this time? Yes, it's, yes. we can see it. Okay. All right, so as she mentioned, the topic is musculoskeletal MRI sports, um, and I'm gonna focus on uh, imaging of the knee, but the principles are the same really throughout uh, imaging of the other joints. So 
when we, um, here's the outline of the talk. So we'll discuss some important anatomy, technical considerations for assessing this anatomy and all the applications around the knee. So the knee joint, like other joints in the MSK system, has all these different structures that we need to assess. So of course, there's the bone, which has the cortical cancellous bone, and the bone marrow. So bone marrow, we have to remember, is fatty marrow plus hematopoietic marrow normally. Um, and part of the uh, marrow exam um, of the joints is uh, you just have to remember that it's limited depending on the kinds of sequences that we use and we'll discuss that because marrow imaging is kind of a whole nother topic uh, in itself. Then we uh, assess the overlying articular cartilage which tends to be very thin so we need a lot of resolution to be able to see the cartilage and we'll discuss some approaches to cartilage imaging. Then there's uh, in the knee especially there's fibrocartilage so in the knee it's the meniscus um, which we'll talk about. And then there are all these supporting structures for the joints, so the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and of course you always have to assess the joint space and the synovial lining for synovitis and synovial diseases. So when we think about the approach to imaging the joint, it's different uh, than imaging other pathologies such as tumor or inflammation. So for joint imaging, because we're dealing with very small structures, we really need to maximize our signal to noise uh, ratio and our spatial resolution. Uh, and at the same time, we also need very fluid sensitive sequences because most injuries have fluid around them. So if there's a ligament tear, there's usually edema around it. However, when you're imaging something like tumor or inflammation, you really want pure contrast weighting. So you want uh, really pure T1 and uh, T2 imaging. And then you can also think about physiologic imaging to um, assess tumor. So that's a whole other topic that I'm not gonna get into, but just so we're on, you know, the framework here is how do we, how do we design our protocol for imaging the joints correctly? And it's really the, the idea is to maximize your signal and spatial resolution. So everyone's familiar, I'm sure, with these types of graphs. Um, and parameters for MRI. So when we think about how to design these sequences, um, you think about your time to repetition and uh, the maximum signal is at a later TR uh, in your image. And then when you think about your echo time, then you're starting with the maximum signal. So a shorter echo time will give you uh, maximal signal for your image, which will, uh, translates to, you know, using a high TR, short TE sequence, preferably to maximize your signal, uh, your SNR in the images. And then you can uh, trade some of that for spatial resolution. So high, so a high TR, short TE then is an intermediate weighted or proton density weighted uh, sequence. And that's why we tend to use a lot of um, intermediate weighting for a joint evaluation. So for so a straight non-fat suppressed intermediate weighted or proton density sequence is what we used for to look at the anatomy and for high spatial resolution and then to get our fluid sensitive sequence we can fat sat that sequence or um, another approach is to use pure uh, T2 so uh, you can increase your TE some more to make it more fluid sensitive fat suppressed T2 and that will reduce your um, SNR a little bit, but um, it'll give you very fluid sensitive sequences. Or another approach is STIR, although that doesn't give you as much um, signal as a, as a uh, you know, fast spin echo, fat suppressed PD or T2 weighted sequence. Whereas when we're trying to image tumor and inflammation, then we're using pure T1 and pure T2 because we're trying to characterize the disease process more. And then we can add things like diffusion and contrast for physiologic imaging of the tumor. So it's a different approach, tumor inflammation versus uh, joint evaluation. Okay, so what's good about the musculoskeletal system is there's a lot of fat, right? So there's bone marrow has fat, subcutaneous fat, and so on. And the fat outlines all the structures for us. And so um, we can see the anatomy really well. So when we create these intermediate weighted non-fat suppressed sequences. We can see all the anatomy, the tendons, muscles, etc. 
cartilage. Um, and then we can fat suppress all this fat to bring out all the fluid, which is high signal, of course, on a fluid sensitive sequence. So our approach at Hopkins is to do one non-fat suppressed intermediate weighted sequence and then a fat suppressed intermediate weighted sequence for all our joint imaging. Okay, so with and without fat suppression, an intermediate weighted proton density sequence. Now, other um, approaches could include, let's say, doing a proton density without fat suppression um, and with fat suppression in the sagittal plane, and then adding a pure T1 um, just in case there's something in the marrow, or a pure uh, fat suppressed T2 just to get a little bit more fluid sensitive. You could do that in some of the planes. That's not what we do at Hopkins because we're just going for um, maximum anatomy and uh, fluid and um, SNR and, and resolution. Okay, so here we can compare though, if you want to try a different approach, is a fat suppressed uh, intermediate weighted sequence versus a fat suppressed T2 sequence, which is more heavily um, weighted towards T2, so a longer TE. And the difference is that if your PD sequence is not um, fluid sensitive enough, you might miss the subchondral um, you know, edema that's associated with this articular cartilage abnormality. But we see the articular cartilage abnormality better on this um, high resolution image, which is why we use, um, why we use this approach um, in our practice. So you can see the structure is a little bit better. But then if you feel that you need, uh, you know, and then there, it, you can also learn to read the subchondral changes, um, which can be subtle on this type of sequence uh, over time. But if you feel that you need something more fluid sensitive, then you can go for a fat suppressed T2 in one of the, one of the planes. Okay, so why fat suppression is important. It, if we make everything black, then it improves the contrast between all the structures so we can see the anatomy really well. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of our joint imaging is at 3T because we want to maximize signal and you get a lot more chemical shift artifact at 3T. So for example, here is an example of chemical shift artifact. In practice, it's really not a problem because people learn to recognize that this is just chemical shift, uh, but you can fix it by fat suppressing the image. And so you know that it's not edema, it's just um, chemical shift artifact. Okay, so here's our patient that needs a knee MRI. This is a football player that got injured. And so our first uh, choice is what field strength should we use? And uh, what's the appeal of T for joint imaging? Well, um, obviously we know there's more signal in 3T versus 1.5T. And so we can trade some of that signal for spatial resolution and or speed. So, um, so if you can, you can compare 1.5 versus 3T, um, the parameters, you can uh, increase your spatial resolution quite a bit. So you can make it two millimeters rather than four millimeters thick with the same matrix or keep the thickness and then increase the matrix size. Either way, your box size can uh, you know, decrease and um, in the same amount of time, you can get the, the images in, in all the planes that you need. Otherwise, you can also trade for speed, so decrease scan time and increase patient throughput, which is a big factor for us here in the United States anyway. There's always a lot of pressure, a lot of patients that need to get on our scanners, so we try to, uh, and I'll talk about this also, other ways to improve speed um, that we have, um, we have joint imaging in under 10 minutes now. But uh, so things you can do is you can decrease your necks. So maybe you just use one neck, which would give you enough um, signal and information on your 3T joint MRI. And you can also add parallel imaging, which speeds things up as well. So here's just a protocol example. I, we showed, showed you a little bit before about what you can do for, with the parameters in terms of thickness, slice gap, field of view is the same. The matrix can increase. So you're gonna increase your voxel sizes at 3T for the same amount of time as a 1.5T scan. So this is for a 2D sequence. And um, when we're imaging the knee, as in other joints, we typically need three planes to assess um, the structures correctly. 
So you can do this by getting three planes independently, or now with the advent of 3D volumetric sequences, um, which is our approach here at Hopkins, we acquire one sagittal plane, fat suppressed and non-fat suppressed, and then we reconstruct or reformat the sagittal into coronal, axial, and then really any oblique plane that we need. So in the knee, a lot of these structures can be lying obliquely. And so you can, uh, as shown here with the anterior cruciate ligament, we can reorient um, the plane so that we show the ACL um, to best advantage. But if you don't have 3D biometric sequences, um, and these are product sequences on, on many scanners now, or you're not comfortable using them yet, then uh, you can, of course, do the traditional 2D fast binaco sequences, so intermediate weighted and fat suppressed intermediate weighted sequences in all three planes separately. So, um, but you know, obviously, if you have the 3D biometric sequences, you really you you can really push the the scanner time, and uh, a lot of what we do now is under 10 minutes. So the 3D imaging, um, we get isotropic voxels, 0.3 millimeters, um, and we typically do it in the sagittal plane and then reconstruct in the other planes, as I said. So it's similar to CT scanning nowadays where um, you can just get one acquisition and then we can, you know, reformat the images in all the different planes. So here's our protocol, a non-fat suppressed 3D volumetric sequence and a fat suppressed 3D volumetric sequences reformatted in all the other planes. And this is under 10 minutes for us currently. And we do this for knee, ankle, foot, um, elbow, wrist. This type of sequence doesn't work as well for the big joints like hip and shoulder. And so traditionally for those, we use uh, more 2D um, fast binaco. Uh, sequences. So if you're doing 2D acquisitions, so you get your axial off the, off the um, scalp first, and here's your axial image, and then you can design your sagittal and coronal. So your sagittal, it's important to remember that you're going to cover the entire femur, medial to lateral, include the fibular collateral ligament attachments, which go down, uh, and, and, the, and the lateral collateral ligament complex, which includes the biceps femoris, insertion that we'll talk about later that goes to the fibula. So you definitely want to get, um, you know, all the way across with your sagittal sequence to be able to get the fibula and the biceps attachment. And then the coronal, you want to angle relative to the distal femur, and then you go all the way through the patella and all the way through the popliteal vessels. Um, that should, that's the complete exam. So here's a sample protocol. So your 2D fast binaco sequences, um, you can do all intermediate weighted and fast press intermediate weighted, or you can add some T2s in some of the planes. And some people, you know, feel more comfortable having at least one T1 sequence somewhere in the uh, protocol, and you could do that in coronal planes. So one of yours could be substituted for, uh, one of your PDs could be substituted for a, a pure T1 non-fat suppressed. Um, so T1 is good for bone marrow, but uh, really nothing else that you would need it for um, in assessing the joints. In our practice, we don't do that because we do the 3D volumetric sequences, as I mentioned, so we stick with fat suppressed PD and straight PD. Okay, so some specific considerations when designing your protocol. So the meniscus, um, the most sensitive sequence for assessing the meniscus is the intermediate weighted sequence. And um, these are the parameters so that you want to use. Um, this is pertaining to the 2D sequences. So somewhere between 16 and 26 to avoid artifacts and improve your sensitivity for um, identifying these tears. Other things to think about is, uh, do you need to use STIR? Well, you might want to do that if there's metal in the field of view so that you don't get so much um, artifact. And also for some, some uh, scanners the, in the longitudinal planes, you can get in the sagittal and coronal, you can get some failure of fat suppression at the edges and you may want to use STIR in that case if you need to. We don't use gradient echo. Um, you can consider it if you, feel that you um, want to detect calcification or hemosiderin in the, in the joint. We don't um, 
advocate that because it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't carry a lot of signal to begin with. Um, so if you're going for a fast protocol, then it seems like um, it would be a waste of time to, to add this. There are, there is uh, some thought that maybe you want to you know, in the old days, I think not so much the approach right now was to use 3D spoiled gradient echo images to look at the articular cartilage, um, which I think we don't need to do with the admin of these 3D fast spin echo sequences anymore. And then do we need to give contrast either intra-articular or intravenous? You can consider this for the post-operative joint. Um, I, we don't do this much because uh, I think we do fine without it. Um, we're not big users of MR arthrography in the knee. We do it for post-op shoulder frequently or and sometimes for the hip, for the labrum, because these are very difficult structures um, to assess. And the other use well, used to be evaluating uh, osteochondritis desiccans for stability, but we can do that pretty well without uh, IV contrast. So the idea was intra-articular IV contrast, looking for um, contrast enhancement around the osteochondral fragment to indicate instability. So this one has fluid or contrast all around uh, the fragment, which means this is a, a fragment that is in situ, but unstable. And so it can break off at any point. So this would be a stage three osteochondritis desiccans. And when it breaks off, of course, we can look for osteochondral fragments in the joint, as we see in this case. Okay, so just to keep everyone awake then, what sequence have we been talking about? Um, what would we choose to image the joints to maximize SNR? And I kind of beat it to death already. Um, we said the PD is the sequence of choice here for maximizing SNR. And we do this with and without fat suppression. Okay, so let's review our anatomy of the knee and how we, uh, our approach to interpretation here. So there are three compartments in the knee. There's medial, lateral, and patellofemoral. And of course the boundaries, you know, the, the um, femur, tibia, and patella. So this is what um, we're looking at with our PD and fat suppressed uh, PD sequences. So first thing with the bone is we know there's bone cortex, which is black on all sequences normally, and then there's bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, we have typically red marrow and uh, fatty marrow. So this is a lot of red marrow with red marrow reconversion. Normally, um, we're not supposed to see red marrow that uh, extends uh, so uniformly across into the epiphysis, although it can happen over time. And um, what we can see very well with the, the intermediate weighted sequence is subchondral changes of sclerosis associated with um, cartilage loss and osteoarthritis, as we see here. So these are flame-shaped subchondral areas of sclerosis. So that's the typical um, cartilage lesion, a high-grade cartilage lesion that's associated with uh, subchondral bone marrow changes, they're defined as, they typically show up as this flame shape or triangle that you see here. So I have this in red here. So th just remember that uh, if you use a PD and not a T1, this is not a marrow specific sequence. So you shouldn't be really assessing the bone marrow on this type of sequence. If you see anything unusual in the bone marrow, you should get a separate, well, our approach is to get a separate tumor protocol, which includes pure T1 imaging, as well as other things that we use like diffusion weighted imaging, chemical shift imaging, which I'm not gonna talk about today because that's a whole other topic um, with tumor imaging. So, um, so the image here is just to show you that um, you can see a lot of subchondral changes with osteoarthritis that we see very well with the PD and then later, as I showed you earlier, also some, with the fat suppressed PD, you look for a bone marrow edema like signal that's associated with cartilage defects. Um, and try not to, uh, you know, don't put too much stock into assessing the bone marrow with PD because this is both T1 and T2 signal in here. And so you really can't make a judgment to characterize what's going on. Typically, this ill-defined signal in here is red marrow, but because it goes into the distal um, uh, you know, epiphysis uh, so uniformly like this, then 
um, we think about some other prop possibilities that could happen here, like um, a marrow infiltrative disorders that we can assess with different studies and clinically and so on. So if you're thinking that there is some marrow problem, then you want to get pure T1 imaging and more marrow specific sequences. So here's what a tumor looks like. So there's normal fatty marrow. The tumor can is usually dark and well-defined. It could be intermediate uh, signal also on a pure T1. But the characteristic is that there's normal fatty marrow, which is bright, and then a sharp border with the uh, lesion, which is marrow replacing, um, uh, in this case, an osteosarcoma. So when we're imaging our joints, um, you know, we're really not focusing on bone tumor imaging here. We're focusing on all the joint anatomy. But just to keep it in the back of your mind that if you see find something funny in the marrow, then order a separate type of uh, study, uh, you know, dedicated for marrow imaging. So other things that you that are important to assess in the bone marrow are on our fluid sensitive sequences. These help you with um, trying to determine what happened to this patient and uh, you know, um, de deciding the mechanism of injury. So here are two axial sequences and this patella and femur. So we see that there's bone marrow edema in the medial patella and then the lateral femur. So this is a person who has bone contusions. So this part of the patella had to this part of the femur. So we know that this person had a lateral patellar dislocation. So these bone contusions are very helpful in deciding what kind of uh, injury, um, mechanism of injury the person under uh, had, had experienced. In this case, lateral patellar dislocation, there are certain patterns that we'll see later that are characteristic of an ACL injury with um, pivot shift uh, injuries. So, um, so this is a lateral patellar dislocation and earlier, I had already showed you some subchondral bone marrow changes associated with the articular cartilage. Now, when you try to assess the articular cartilage itself um, in the joints, uh, we know that this is a very thin structure and really very complex. So here's the histology and all these different zones um, that are marked by um, different orientations of the collagen uh, fiber within the articular cartilage. So here's bone, the end plate, the radial zone where the articular, um, the collagen uh, in the articular cartilage is more vertical than uh, a transition zone where it becomes, um, has a more tangential orientation at the surface of the articular cartilage, which resists um, uh, you know, impact and force. And then, of course, uh, the substance of the cartilage with the chondrocytes, um, proteoglycans, and so on. There's a calcified component here um, before the bone. Okay, so the imaging approach is to articular cartilage. What we do clinically is just a morphologic imaging. So we just look for cartilage defects, fissures, thinning of the cartilage. But there are other approaches to um, look for pre-morphologic changes, so physiologic imaging, that would be things like T2 mapping um, and T1 row imaging. The articular cartilage, as I said, it's very thin, and so depending on your sequencing, if you don't, if you have, um, you know, 2D sequences, 1.5T, maybe your resolution's not that great for seeing articular cartilage. In this person, we can see that there is some fluid signal, which is what you expect when there's a cartilage defect. But the hallmark of knowing that there's a defect there is we see all this subchondral bone marrow edema um, really well. And then similarly over here, you see that the cartilage is a little bit more normal out medially, but then toward the notch, it's more uh, heterogeneous. Once you see the subchondral bone marrow edema, and as I said before, it's typically flame shaped or triangular when it's associated with a cartilage uh, abnormality. Typically, when you see the bone marrow edema, it's a, it means that you're dealing with a fairly high-grade articular cartilage um, abnormality, either a fissure, a defect, that kind of thing. Uh, so 
this is what normal articular cartilage is like. Um, we don't see the zones that well, but you can kind of hallucinate that they're the uh, zone from more superficial to uh, deeper uh, along the articular cartilage layer. So with, this is without fat suppression, with fat suppression, it's basically intermediate weighted. Uh, and when you have a defect, you're looking for fluid signal that um, takes the place of the articular cartilage. You can see it on both the intermediate weighted and the fluid sensitive sequence. So when we think about cartilage defects, um, when we have a trauma to the joint or the knee in this case, um, a traumatic cartilage defect looks like this, where it's well marginated and has sharper borders. If you have Inflammatory arthritis, typically you get uniform diffuse thinning of the articular cartilage. And when you have osteoarthritis, which is what we see all the time in practice, it's usually multifocal uh, defects um, throughout the articular cartilage. And then in a later stage, it becomes uniform thickening, thinning and uh, denuded um, with subchondral bone marrow changes and so on and looks a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more like inflammatory arthritis, although you have a lot of osteophytes. But here you have a traumatic defect that's well marginated in a patient with trauma. Um, so I mentioned earlier, like when do you use gradient echo? So this was an older approach, wouldn't be our approach to use doing this anymore, but uh, because we think we see our cartilage defects well enough with a fat suppressed T2 sequence, a different approach was to use 3D spoiled gradient echo. So on this sequence, the cartilage is actually bright, and then you see the water, which is dark, taking the place of the cartilage defects on the spoiled gradient echo sequence over here. So we don't think we need to use this anymore, but it does give you a lot of resolution more than, say, a fluid sensitive sequence generally. Okay, so our approach, we have high resolution and um, we use a 3D fast spin echo to look at our um, articular cartilage. There are a variety of other 3D type sequences for looking at cartilage. I'm sure you've heard of like all kinds of steady state uh, sequences. The DES is the most um, popular and has been included in many clinical trials. Uh, but this is what they look like. They, they all provide um, the same idea. It's intermediate signal of the cartilage and then when you see a, a cartilage cartilage loss there's fluid signal where the cartilage should be. Um, this is our approach as I said 3D fast spin echo so this is a very high resolution and you see the cartilage well enough so in this case we see that there's a articular cartilage big defect over here and then even uh, a fissure that goes into an area of delamination where the cartilage is lifted off the bone and then subchondral bone marrow edema associated. This is a different patient with, again, a well-marginated, um, very clearly identified defect on a non-fat suppressed image. Uh, so this is a traumatic defect of the uh, patella. I mentioned another approach to imaging cartilage is physiologic imaging or pre-morphologic imaging. So now you're trying to detect cartilage abnormalities before we can actually see them um, as defects and fissures. Um, <clears throat> you know, that we can see it anatomically. So here, probably the most popular is T2 mapping. Degemeric or contrast enhanced imaging has been used. T1 rows and sodium are very experimental. Um, we, don't, we don't really use these uh, routinely, but you know, as more treatments are developed for osteoarthritis, it, becomes, it may become important to identify pre-morphologic cartilage loss in patients. Okay, so we talked about bone and articular cartilage, and now we're going to talk about the menisci, which is fibrocartilage of the, of the knee. So the menisci are these C-shaped structures. We have a medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. They absorb a third of the impact of uh, the load that the joint is exposed to, so that's their function. And MRI is very good for identifying uh, tears. So compared with arthroscopy, essentially the negative predictive value is about 100%. So if we don't see the tear, that means it's not there. <clears throat> and I mentioned earlier that our most sensitive sequence is the short TE or proton density weighted sequence for uh, looking at the menisci. Uh, 
So on sagittal and coronal, as we're cutting through the menisci, there we see that there are these triangular bow tie uh, type structures. They're normally black, composed of fibrocartilage um, on all sequences. If you see increased signal, then it could be due to artifact, it could be due to degeneration within the meniscus, or it could be due to a tear. So meniscal degeneration, uh, this is an example of where you have grade one, uh, where it's kind of globular signal within the uh, joint that's not fluid signal per se, just some intermediate signal. Grade two is linear and grade three is considered uh, a tear. In our practice, we don't, um, go, we don't uh, report whether there is uh, grade one or grade two degeneration. We just say, okay, is it torn or is it not torn? And then describe the tear fully. So I don't think it's important clinically to, dis to describe at this point anyway, whether um, you, know, you see any degeneration in the meniscus. So here's what a tear looks like. So the tear is, um, this happens to be a vertical tear. Uh, the, there's uh, typically linear signal that extends to the articular uh, surface of the meniscus. So the, either superiorly or inferiorly. So whereas the degenerate, degeneration of the meniscus, it doesn't go to the articular surface. Uh, the tear has to uh, um, extend all the way to the articular surface, which we see is disrupted here at least on two cuts. So either it could be a sagittal and coronal or two sagittals or two coronal images, for example. And these are the different types of meniscal tears. So longitudinal, horizontal, inner margin, complex, bucket handle. Okay, so this is a longitudinal tear. You'll see it as a vertical uh, tear all the way through and through um, the meniscus. The oblique or horizontal tear that we see here, um, Again, you see always the tears extend to the articular surface, either superiorly or inferiorly. Then the inner margin tear, which uh, is a radial tear. These um, are significant because they don't heal well. Then a flap tear, as you see here. This is what a radial tear looks like on sagittal view. And then on axial view, where you see the line going through the meniscus um, along the C-shaped um, uh, axial image of the meniscus. Then there's the flap tear. So flap tear is essentially a radial tear plus oblique component. Um, this is involving the body and you can get a displaced flap tear. So this one is displaced into the meniscotibial recess. It's really important uh, for us to identify these flap uh, tears and where they're displaced because especially this location is not a location that the surgeon may uh, automatically go and uh, look at unless you uh, report it clearly in your dictation, the flap tear with a displaced flap component in the miscotibial recess. But these, uh, you know, these flap components can be displaced posteriorly, anteriorly, centrally, other locations. Okay, this is a very large, the bucket handle tear goes anterior body, posterior horn, um, and is displaced centrally. So it's a longitudinal tear with this displaced fragment. And I'm sure you've probably heard of the um, double PCL sign. So on sagittal view, this is a displaced fragment that um, uh, looks like a second PCL, but it's actually the meniscal fragment displaced centrally. And similarly here, we see the component, the vertical um, longitudinal component here and the displaced fragment centrally on the coronal view. Okay, so there are some pitfalls when we interpret the meniscus. Um, normal structures, so the one that uh, we need to know about is a transverse ligament. It goes from anterior horn, the medial meniscus, the lateral meniscus, and here it is on axial view. It comes across, it's not a meniscal tear, it's just a normal structure. There are the meniscal femoral ligaments. There's Humphrey and Riceberg. So Humphrey with an H is anterior to the PCL and Riceberg with a W. So it goes alphabetically as posterior to the PCL. This one is a Humphrey ligament. Um, so these are, <clears throat> these are not meniscal fragments. You just have to know about these um, meniscal femoral ligaments um, when interpreting the meniscus. Sometimes you'll see some abnormal signal and, and partial tears of these. Um, and these could be a cause of pain, but not, not surgical um, in any way. And then when you 
okay, so what else do we look for with meniscal tears is you can get meniscal cysts, so intrameniscal and paramenisical cysts. Usually often with an oblique horizontal tear, as we see in this case, the body with this large paramenisical cyst extending from it. Then there are meniscal variants. So the most common one is the discoid meniscus. It's usually lateral. So it means it's a large and dysplastic uh, meniscus. It doesn't transmit the forces, absorb the forces um, the way we like in the knee. And so there, these uh, discoid menisci are prone to tear. Uh, so the way you diagnose a discoid meniscus is if it's greater than 13 millimeters on the coronal view. So this is going all the way across. Usually you measure this at the body of the meniscus. They can be very painful and they, as I said, they predispose to tear. Then when assessing the postoperative meniscus, you can consider the use of IV contrasts, we, IV or intraarticular contrast, I should say. Um, we don't do that in our practice. We just rely on our routine high resolution sequences for this purpose. Um, but conventional MRI reportedly is 67% and specific for diagnosing a recurrent tear, where if you, add, if you do MR arthrography, whether indirect or direct, then you can get up to 78%. So why is not that specific is because when, um, when they go in to repair the meniscus, they debride this part of it, and the original tear is this linear signal. Uh, it doesn't go away. And so the only way you know if this tear is recurrent is if you see frank fluid signal, which is the case here, um, or if you give IV contrast in the joint and you see that the IV contrast is going into this linear signal. So this could be residual signal from uh, the original tear. Unless you see fluid signal, then I go and say, no, this is uh, more concerning for a recurrent tear. Um, but I'll often dictate in the report, okay, I see this linear signal and this is, um, only 78% uh, specific for the presence of a recurrent tear. Okay, so that was a, <clears throat> a lot about the meniscus. Now we're gonna talk about the ligaments. So here's a skier. They like to tear their cruciate ligaments, especially the ACL. So here are all the different ligaments um, that we'll talk about, the ACL, PCL, medial collateral ligament complex, lateral collateral ligament complex are the big ones. Okay, so ACL. ACL we can assess on all planes, so sagittal, coronal, axial. Um, and it's a structure that's supposed to essentially uh, more or less parallel Blumenschatz line, which is the posterior part of the femur here on the sagittal view. The ACL is composed of these two bundles that we see best on coronal view, anteromedial and posterior lateral bundles. The anteromedial is stronger and more important of the two. And then you can also assess it on the axial view. If you have 3D sequences, then you can, um, you know, manipulate your sequences to lay out this uh, ligament very clearly if needed. But so as I said, there are two bundles. There's the anteromedial and posterior lateral uh, bundles of the ACL. And so when you know, assessing the structure, you're not just gonna say there's a tear. Um, so if you say, if you see a tear, like you wanna say, is it proximal, mid or distal portion of the ACL, but also is it involving both bundles or is it involving one of the bundles and which one? So you can have partial ACL tears that involve one of the bundles. And these can be biomechanically significant or not. I mentioned with 3D sequences that what's nice about these is you can reorient uh, your image to show the ACL if you're having a hard time <clears throat> deciphering whether it's intact or not. And that's how we, this is a, a plane, for example, that we could use to assess the ACL clearly. So here's an example of a complete uh, tear of the ACL. Uh, it's a proximal complete tear. We don't see any hemorrhagic mass around it. So this we know is at least subacute to chronic. But then on the fluid sensitive sequence, we see that there's this anterolateral osteochondral injury of the femur and posterolateral tibial bone contusion. This is the classic pivot shift injury. So as we saw with the lateral patellar dislocation, there's a classic um, mechanism of injury that occurs to tear your ACL, and we can see this on MRI by the contusion pattern that we see 
Um, so the classic thing is the deep, deep femoral notch sign that we would see on a plane foam, which corresponds to this osteochondral injury and depression of the articular surface here associated with bone marrow edema and then the bone contusion posterior lateral tibia. You also often see posterior medial tibial uh, contusions as well. And you can also see fractures of the lateral tibial and medial tibial plateau, um, depending on how severe the injury is. So in this case, we see a complete proximal ACL tear. There's, if in the very acute phase, you'll see this a lot of blood products around it and a hematoma. We don't see that here. So we know this thing is probably four to six weeks out because we, because we see the contusions and the contusion pattern goes away somewhere at six to eight weeks. And so um, this would be considered a subacute complete ACL tear. And so in the chronic phase, you'll see that the contusion pattern goes away. Okay, so the ACL reconstruction, I'm not gonna go through it all. You can get hamstring, use hamstring grafts or bone patellar tendon bone grafts, um, and they can do single bundle or double bundle reconstruction. So be very clear in your report, are you, is it a complete ACL with um, both bundles torn or partial ACL with one of the bundles? So something you have to do with uh, post-op ACL is assess the graft. And you can assess the graft for failure, it means it tore. It can be malpositioned, malaligned. Um, you can get impingement, which is probably less common nowadays with the way they're, um, they place the grafts and then complications at wherever the donor site is. So especially if you're doing a bone patellar tendon bone graft, you can get complications at the <clears throat> patellar tendon, patella tendon and patella bone itself at that site on the, on the knee MRI. Okay, so here's an ACL reconstruction and uh, the screws you see in the femur and the distal tibia. They typically uh, make this more vertical than the Blumenschatt line uh, when uh, reconstructing. And in this patient, you see that they, this person had a bone patellar tendon bone graft. They take the, the middle third of the patellar tendon um, and piece of bone to, um, reconstruct the ACL. In this case, um, there's a tear at the um, site of uh, donor site over here, which should be reported um, as a donor complication. So some of the things you'll see with uh, these ACL tunnels, they can become wide over time and form ganglia like this one. This could be biomechanically significant, so you could uh, report it, or it may be insignificant uh, clinically. And then of course, the dreaded one where you um, can have a complete graft failure. So there's a complete uh, mid portion tear and the ACL is retracted distally. Um, should you give IV contrast? We don't need it for this purpose, but um, in this patient we have, here's the ACL graft. It appears to be intact, but there's a lot of arthrofibrosis of the distal ACL which when you give IV contrast will enhance because it's basically scar tissue. And this is something that um, is one of the complications of um, uh, having you know, ACL reconstruction. So I don't think we need to give IV contrast because you see it very clearly on the non-fat suppressed um, sequence. Okay, the PCL, like the ACL, um, has two bundles. Instead of anterior medial posterior lateral, it's anterior lateral posterior medial. The bundles tend to be uh, together more, so we don't see them as uh, distinctly as we do with the ACL. But again, uh, like the ACL, we uh, evaluate this on all planes, so sagittal, coronal, axial. And uh, here's, an, you know, and the ligaments in general, like tendons, um, are black on all sequences unless there's artifact, which we can certainly get with magic angle, for example, because these are often oblique structures, or there's degeneration of the ligaments. Um, so you can get mucoid degeneration of the ACL and PCL, which I uh, didn't show here. Or you can have a tear. In this case, it's a mid-portion uh, PCL tear. So this is through and through. This would be non-surgical, but uh, importantly uh, to identify is if it's a distal tear with an avulsion, of the bone, then this would be a surgical PCL tear. And so, um, you know, always important to identify these. 
So with the PCL, you can have proximal and mid portion complete tears that they'll just let heal, but then uh, the distal tear is the one that you wanna be very clear about identifying because they'll go to surgery. All right, so then onto the collateral ligament. So medial collateral ligament has superficial and deep components. Here we see the superficial really well um, and the deep uh, component, deep meniscofemoral ligament. Uh, with it, you can get a small bursa in between deep MCL bursitis. Um, and then the other important thing here is the posterior medial corner. And we'll uh, talk about that <clears throat> as well. So ligament sprains with the collateral ligaments, um, as with ligaments elsewhere in other joints, um, we talk about grade one, grade two, grade three. So grade one is basically a stretch injury and it's a mild ligament sprain where you just see edema adjacent to the ligament. Grade two is a partial tear of the ligament. So not completely torn, but you see some fluid signal within the ligament, just not completely through and through. And grade three is complete. So there's fluid in the ligament all the way through and it's disrupted. <clears throat> so this is a grade uh, two where you have signal in the ligament and around it. Um, so grade two MCL sprain. And this is a complete grade three where it's through and through with periarticular, uh, with periligamentous edema as well. Um, we talked about mechanism of injury with the ACL and then with the lateral patellar dislocation where we see bone contusions in association with these uh, um, injuries. And here you can see that there's a lateral bone contusion. So this is a patient that was hit from the lateral side of the knee and stretched this um, MCL. And here in this case, we see a grade one. So it's periligamentous edema without signal in the ligament itself or disruption. So this is a kind of a typical contusion pattern associated with a MCL injury. Okay, so then there's the posterior medial corner. So here's the meniscus, the sagittal view. So posterior horn of the medial meniscus, posterior menis medial meniscus is part of the posterior medial corner. This is semimembranosis attachment coming down. And then there's some little ligaments back here in the so post, uh, posterior medial corner, which include the POL and OPL. So posterior oblique ligament, oblique popliteal ligament. You'll see them as these linear structures in the um, posterior medial corner. And uh, if there's disruption to the posterior medial corner, you will, you, you'll see that there is um, L-defined signal. You won't be able to make out these linear structures. So always look for these linear structures. You should have enough resolution in your image to be able to see this. If you don't, then you should suggest a posterior medial corner injury. And then you can always look at the semimembranosis separately. So you can get semimembranosis insertional tendinopathy and tears. And of course, the meniscus, we talked about how to diagnose meniscal tears already. So posterior medial corner injuries are important um, because they can lead to <clears throat> instability. Okay, so another question, um, we're gonna talk about the lateral compartment now, which we haven't done yet. So posterior medial corner is what we talked about. Um, the more famous corner is the posterior lateral corner. Um, so which of these structures is not located in the lateral compartment of the knee? And the answer is um, the arcuate ligament, yes. The popliteus tendon, yes. Biceps femoris, of course. IT band is anterior and lateral, yes. But the anterior medial bundle is a part of the ACL. So nothing to do with the medial or lateral. Okay, so lateral collateral ligament is a complex, lateral LCL complex. So this has a lot of structures in it. The fibular collateral ligament proper, <clears throat> Then the big structures, fibular collateral ligament proper, the popliteus tendon is lateral, popliteal fibular ligament, which we usually see on every study pretty well. The arcuate ligament, which is this Y-shaped structure in the posterior lateral corner, um, we don't, don't see as distinctly. Um, if there's a fibella, there's a fibulofibular ligament. Um, there's the posterior lateral joint capsule itself. And then the other big structure that we always see is biceps femoris tendon. So these top things, and, and something else that is not mentioned here is menisco, um, menisco popliteal fascicles. Um, anyway, these top structures are what comprise the um, posterior lateral corner. 
The IT band is also a lateral structure, but it's anterior and inserts on Gertie's tubercle. So this is the IT band. It's a black tendon, inserts on Gertie's tubercle. It's common in runners to see IT band insertional abnormalities like tendinopathy tears, reactive edema at the site. So something to look for with the IT band. Although um, we don't image usually for the IT band injuries because that's more of a clinical diagnosis. It's really, having had it myself, it's very apparent clinically. So here are the uh, lateral, posterior lateral structures. So fibular collateral ligament, this is an obliquely lying structure. Um, so it inserts distally on the fibula and proximally on the femur. Um, you can look at it on the sagittal view. So fibular collateral ligament here and biceps femoris insertional uh, tendon, uh, more posterior to it. The biceps femoris insertion has a major insertion on the fibula. It also has these other slips that go toward the tibia and other, other areas, and, and there's a lot of variation. But <clears throat> you'll always see the biceps femoris inserting on the fibula, and that's what the main insertion that you'll look for. Uh, and then this is biceps femoris on the coronal view inserting on the fibula. And as I mentioned, there are there's some other smaller slips with a lot of uh, variation in the insertion that can go all the way to the tibia as well. Um, popliteus tendon, so there it starts with the popliteal groove. This is the insertion over here, and then the popliteus muscle, you can follow it around um, in the posterior knee. And here we are last on sagittal view. This is the popliteus tendon. The popliteus tendon, um, <clears throat> the, you can see these linear structures going from the lateral meniscus, posterior horn to the popliteus tendon. These are the uh, superior inferior menis popliteal meniscal fascicles. Um, we don't see it very well on every patient, but usually if your sequence is designed well with good resolution, you'll be able to see these. This is the popliteal fibular ligament. You should be able to see this similarly with good resolution. So this biceps femoris tendon, this is fibula, of course, popliteal fibular ligament, popliteus tendon over here. So this is the posterior lateral corner. On a different patient where there's not quite as much resolution, you can still make out the popliteal fibular ligament. And then more posteriorly, there's the arcuate ligament complex, which is this Y-shaped uh, part, uh, <clears throat> ligamentous structure in the posterior lateral corner. You don't usually see it discreetly, but you know that it's injured if you see a lot of fluid signal in the posterior lateral corner, as you see here. So here, this is a disruption of the uh, fibular collateral ligament, biceps femoris is partially torn, and then you have a lot of edema in this posterior lateral corner, even a bone contusion. And so you know there's posterior lateral corner injury. So this is um, very uh, important, of course, to diagnose because it uh, leads to instability and they have to fix this. And this is a person, another, a lot of fluid, as I mentioned, you can't always see the arcuate ligament well, but it, you see this much fluid, then you know it's injured, and this is uh, a strain of the popliteus muscle also. Okay, so we talked about the ACL, PCL, the cruciate ligaments, and then also the MCL, LCL, and now we're gonna move on to the tendon. So in the knee, uh, we have the quadriceps of the tar tendons are the major. I mentioned also earlier, the posterior medial corner has the semimembranosus insertion, that's important, but. Here, you think, uh, you know, these tendon complexes um, are complexes. They're not just uh, simple tendons inserting on the bone. And to give you an example here, this is the quadriceps tendon, patellar tendon continuation. So gray is tendon going across, red is periosteum, and blue is the uh, prepatellar bursa. So um, you can, essentially see this anatomy to some degree on a routine non-fat suppressed sequence. So the tendon, usually it has some intermediate signal, the quadriceps tendon, it doesn't mean it's torn, it just has some um, <clears throat> increased signal within the substance. Uh, if this becomes fluid signal, then you know this is a tear, this is just normal quadriceps tendon. But yeah, here's the periosteal insertion, the quadriceps continuation, and the patellar tendon. So patellar tendon, you'll notice, is not as thick as the quadriceps tendon. So if the patellar tendon becomes uh, thicker than this or as thick as the quadriceps, then you know there's tendinopathy, which eventually you may get tendon degeneration and partial tears and complete tears and so on. So here, for example, we have the distal tendon is, is 
uh, as thick as the quadriceps tendon, there's some increased signal within a tendinopathy as well as fluid signal. So this is a distal partial tear of the patellar tendon with underlying tendinopathy. Here's quadriceps tendon. It's too thick, a lot of abnormal signal in it. Um, it's a partial tear associated with the tendon. There's also enthesopathy. So this is a bony enthesophyte here along with the quadriceps patellar tendon continuation. So it's enthesopathy slash tendinopathy and partial tear in this case. And then this is where um, you want to be very clear when you have a, um, a full thickness tear is the width of the tendon because this, this is almost, a, it's an urgent surgical condition. They need to uh, repair this. So you evaluate this in multiple planes. You have axial sagittal coronal. The coronal is good to identifying the, the width. So this is almost 100% uh, across. And um, that's important information, the width of the, the tendon tear that you'll want to um, give to the surgeons in your report. OK, so muscle, um, I'm not going to go through diagnosing muscle injuries because that's also kind of a separate uh, lecture, but with muscle injuries, it's grade one, two, three. So ligaments, sprains, they're grade one, two, three also. And with muscle, it's grade one, which is typically we see this feathery type edema. So that's a grade one muscle strain. Um, grade two is a partial tear. So you might see, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, um, not, not a complete rupture, but a uh, uh, partial tear of the muscle. And then grade three is a three and through and through complete rupture. In this case, we have a lot of fluid in the deep fascia as well as uh, the muscle itself tracking down. And this is um, something that we, uh, you should, should be on your radar in the back of your mind um, that happens typically with football players, um, but can happen in other sports as well. There's um, the plantaris muscle, which goes from um, lateral to medial. So here the muscle attaches at the femur laterally and then distally there's a tendon that goes all the way down to insert with the Achilles. And where you'll see if this plantaris muscle ruptures where you'll see the fluid is deep. So again, you'll, you'll see it going from lateral to medial. So this is more superiorly at the level of the femur. There's fluid posteriorly here where the plantaris should be attaching and more distally deep to the medial gastrocnemius because this structure is going lateral to medial. So you'll, that's where you'll see the fluid. Um, <clears throat> and then you may or may not see the tendonous insertion or not. But uh, so this is a person with a plantaris rupture. Uh, it's just so, uh, something to be on your radar because um, maybe it's a little bit more subtle in your, your average uh, muscle injury and you just have to be aware of the anatomy and its presence here. Then also part of our exam is uh, nerve um, assessment and uh, also uh, peripheral nerve imaging is a whole nother topic, which I'm not going to get into, but the nerves in the knee are the distal sciatic, which splits to the common, uh, sorry, the tibial and common perineal nerves. And you see these very clearly on every MRI exam. So you're going to look for enlargement hyperintensity, disruption of the normal architecture uh, of this nerve, but definitely your peripheral nerve um, are, you know, part of your exam of every joint is to look at the peripheral nerves around that uh, structure. On the knee, it's the distal sciatic and tibial and common perineal nerves. Um, okay, and then Finally, I wanted to, I think this, we're getting to the end of this year. So there's a common mass that we see around the knee that um, is the most common mass when they say rule out, uh, you know, palpable mass around the knee. Um, what do you see usually? It's usually a uh, Baker cyst, in this case, rupture. So what's a Baker cyst? It's fluid that communicates with the joint normally and it travels between the semimembranosus and the medial gastrocnemius tendon. So if your fluid signal intensity structure does not travel between these two tendons, then you can't call it a Baker cyst or popliteal cyst. You should be more concerned, could it be a high fluid signal intensity soft tissue tumor, for example. But the popliteal cyst is really, or Baker cyst is the most common mass around the knee and it has to travel between these two structures. 
Um, why do we get a baker's cyst? Well, anytime there are recurrent joint effusions, you'll get uh, a baker's cyst. These baker's cysts can cause problems because they rupture and they can cause pain. Um, in a child, if you see a baker's cyst with really no obvious other internal derangement, um, like ligamentous or tendon injury and so on, um, bone injury, then uh, you should think about an underlying inflammatory arthritis because the baker's cyst is a sign that there are recurrent uh, joint effusions. And why do you get recurrent joint effusions? Well, um, it's usually because you have, uh, you know, you could have synovitis and inflammatory arthritis. Okay, so that's another topic. I, it's also a kind of a, a long uh, topic on its own of how to image synovitis, um, which I'm not uh, Going over. So I really tried to stress sports medicine topics, uh, sports medicine imaging here. We went over important anatomy, uh, some technical considerations when designing these studies and um, applications. So thank you very much and you're welcome to email me with any questions.